go. All right. So now we can talk about Hopper. Um, so Hopper runs only on the Mac and Linux. And it gives you a lot of functionality, uh, quite comparable to Ida Pro, and a full license only costs about 90 bucks, which is very nice. And I've got it here. All right. It is officially only supported for Ubuntu 14 and 16, but I put it on Ubuntu 18, and it seems to work fine. You do need the desktop version, because you want the whole point of it is you want a graphical environment. So all you do is, uh, it is a little bit irritating to install, like almost everything always is on Linux. Uh, they don't bother to uh, put in the requirements. So you have to install all this junk first, which is very strange, because the way I found out to install all this junk is I installed Hopper, and it said, oh no, you have to install this and this and this first. And it doesn't just do that for you, like a Windows installer would. This is, you know, the Linux experience is very strange. This is why no one uses Linux on a desktop. I, I put on Splunk on my Linux last week. I double click the Splunk installer and it goes in the graphic, which I've never done before. But after that, it just sits there. There's no way to start it. You can't find it. There's no shortcut. It's just amazing. The Linux community is about up to the MS-DOS level experience. They haven't made it up to the Windows 3.1 experience yet. Anyway, so you install all this junk and then you can install Hopper. And when you get it, you have a alternate version of Ida Pro. Now the latest version of Ubuntu, they've taken away the start button because they're also imitating the Windows 8 experience, but they've given you this launch pad button, which does actually work. So that's something. At least it creates a shortcut here. If you type H, it'll show you Hopper. And it is a disassembler and a debugger, and it is better than the earlier version, um, although still kind of uh, not very pretty and a little bit hard to use. But still, you know, it is a, I think it's a reasonable competitor for Ida Pro. And it costs 90 bucks for a full license. And if you don't pay for the full license, you can use almost all the features, except it will just shut down every half hour to irritate you. You'll probably see that happen. But that's, um, you can certainly try it enough to see what you've got here. If I open recent, I wonder if it remembers anything. Apparently not. Open. All right. So I'm going to open a, um, let's try home. Yeah. Hmm. All right. I had a, binary I was editing earlier, but somehow it has vanished. So I'll download it again. This is very, very common, as we all know. I think it's, you, you, what's going on here? Maybe it's on a desktop? Let me try the desktop. A file open. Could it be on a desktop? It's not on a desktop, not in download, it's not in documents, fine, okay. Oh, oh, I know why, ah, this is exactly the same thing that would happen in Ida Pro. I'm not opening a file because a file would be a hopper file. I'm reading an executable to disassemble because it's the same as Ida. The file it saves is not the executable. It's all the breakpoints and analysis you put in. So you read an executable and here it is, PWD. This is one of the ones we had in the projects. And then you just say, okay, it now has to analyze it. This is a very small one, so it analyzes it quickly. And you've got an imitation of Ida Pro here. This bar at the top, shows a one-dimensional graph of the file, and it's color-coded. And here's a bar at the right with useless information, and you get rid of it here. This on the left is pretty useful. These are the labeled addresses with things like start and main. And here you have strings, like enter password, fail, you win. This is one of the password guessing things from earlier class. And then there's other things here. They've added new, like processes and bookmarks and stuff, and breakpoints, which is kind of nice. So here, in yellow, I'm in code. You can see this is executable code. When you first load it, it will not show you the bytes that may make the instructions, just like Ida won't. You have to turn that on in the options, just like you do in Ida. I think it was, let me go to my instructions, uh, to get it to show you the bytes. It is... Um, There, it is window preferences. Okay, window. This has actually become more confusing, so it's worth looking. This is the preferences. It's all very much like I do. You have many different tabs, and there are many different show hex column buttons. This took me a while to figure out. This is the one in ASM mode, which is the mode here where you're seeing the code, and there are other modes where you can also turn on the hex column. Anyway, um, so here you have back and forward, to return to where you've been, here's undo and redo. 
to do things. Here are data type flags. This is the same thing in IDA Pro, and it is the fundamental weakness of IDA Pro, um, and really the reason this course exists. It's fundamental weakness of computers. You have a chain of bytes, and your computer does not know what they are. It doesn't know if they are data, a binary data, or ASCII, or executable code, or fixed numerical constants. They could be any of those things, and so IDA and Hopper, when they analyze the file, they will try to guess what part of this is data, what part of this is instructions, and they might get it wrong. So in both products, you can go override its decision. That's what this color code is telling you. This yellow background tells you it decided this stuff was executable code and put it here. And usually it's right, but uh, there's a whole a game of anti-disassembly where you can make assembly code which is not disassemblable by these programs. There's a lot of tricks. One simple trick is to just add like knops in between these, and you can even add invalid things between these and have little jump instructions jumping over them, and it will not get it right because all the disassemblers assume that if the first instruction is two bytes, the next instruction starts right here, and the next instruction starts right here. So if you put an extra byte in there, it's not used, it's not smart enough to realize that, and it will get them all wrong. Anyway, so yeah, as in IDA, you can drag yourself through the file, drag this red arrow through, and you're going through the file in a one-dimensional way. The yellow is code, and the green is stored constants, which is kind of nice, stored strings. So here is where you have strings like enter password, fail, and you win. And just like IDA Pro, you've got the stored data, and over here you have a cross-reference to the data. So if I want to see the message that says, say, you win, I can click here, and then that turns yellow, and if I double-click it, it will take me to the code that does that. And this is the code that will print that. It'll load this uh, argument pointing to this string saying you win, and then call put s to print it on the screen. And here it is printing fail. And up here, there's an if statement. It does a test. And if something is equal, it goes to one of these. And if it's not equal, it goes to the other. That's comparing to see if the password is right and only letting you see the win message if you have the right password. So let me see what else I want to show you. Um, the other, the main reason I ever use Hopper is because of this feature up here called pseudocode view. This is pretty awesome. What we have right now is assembly code view. And this is the same thing you see in IDA Pro. You have the assembly code here. You can also have this one, which is the graphical IDA Pro view. If I close that left pane so you can see it, uh, you'll see this is the one that just puts the code in boxes and puts arrows on it. People seem to think this is enormously useful. I usually don't find it enormously useful, but anyway, they see the same thing in IDA Pro, these arrow boxes. You've got it here, and you can export it to a PDF if you find this to be a handy way to uh, understand the code. I, this is better than it used to be, but it's still pretty painful. Uh, what I really love is this one, pseudocode. It writes C code to duplicate the assembly. This is really very, very nice. Yeah? So maybe you said it, and I missed it, but what was the original language that, that this assembly was compiled to? Uh, C. C. But that's not what I'm getting here, because uh, it's symbols are stripped and it's compiled. It's recreating pseudocode. But it, so you, this C is not really you, good enough that you could compile it and run it, typically. Uh, just like when you have Java reconstructed, it's not good enough to compile and run, but it is good enough to read. And in this case, you can even you can see exactly what's happening. It checks this test PW function and uh, print it out this way. So I find this extremely helpful to analyze binaries. If I'm getting nowhere, I just turn it into C, and then I can just read it. The only problem is you often have no meaningful variable names, so it gets sort of cumbersome, but still you can often spot what's happening. And here I can see that if I wanted to crack into this thing by determining what the password should be, I need to go look in this test PW function. I wonder what happens if I click that. Yeah, it goes to the test PW function and automatically turns it into C too, which is pretty nice. And I don't think it did that in the earlier version. So this is the actual code. Of course, here, you may remember this thing from an earlier project. This is designed to be hard to read. It does a bunch of binary operations to try to create a password that's hard to predict. So it can't really do that for you. The point of this one was not to figure out what the password was by reading the code, but to use a buffer overflow hack in, because it's ultimately going to do a get s right here. And this is an unlimited get s into variable 20, so you can overflow the buffer. And um, anyway. So that's some fun things. You can see the ASCII strings by just dragging to the green part. We've done that. Um, those are the stored text data. And so we can look at the memory layout in here. If there are two ways to do it, if we 
show the segment list. Navigate, uh, show segment list is in here someplace. There we are. This gives us some memory segments, but I find these to be pretty useless. Nothing very valuable here. Um, but I find the other one a lot more useful. Navigate, uh, show section list. This is very much like what we saw looking into um, immunity. You've got many sections here. These are uh, libraries. And down here, we got the program linkage table, which we use to hack into things with uh, format string vulnerabilities and other things. And we should be able to see here's the global, global offset table used to the same purpose. And there's data. And I think that's the stack. Anyway, this is uh, some of the memory segments. Now, you don't see some of the segments you expect, like the normal stack and the heap here, because the program is not running. These are the predefined memory segments in the header of the PE, uh, PE file. The rest are created dynamically once it's running. And we can use this program as a debugger and have it running, but we're not doing that now. Right now, this is static code analysis. By the way, just like Ida, you go to Windows and you often end up somewhere strange where you don't want to be and you want to find your way home. And in here, it is window show assembly will take you back home. And that's what this button will too, takes you back to the normal place. All right. And so you can also view stuff in hex. So let's go to um, bring back the strings and labels section and go to say main. And then I could dump it in hex if I wanted to right click here. Um, let's see. This one here, I went 400,000 in the segments box and went go to, that's another way to get it. Let's try that. Let's navigate segments. Here's the segment list. I can see the whole program starts here at 400,000. Remember, all executables think they are at 400,000 in Windows anyway. I can go there. And now I'm in a section that is just data stored. You see the ELF here. It is not executable code but you can view it in the hex viewer. And I think that's one of these options up here. Um, yep, that shows me the hex editor, which should be pretty familiar by now. We've used quite a few hex editors. You see them at the bottom of Wireshark and HXD. You can view the file in this format if you want. And on the right, you'll see the readable text. And on the left, byte by byte, what you've got. All right. And so here's all the sections. You can use symbols to move around. We've done this and uh, we've seen that code. All right. So suppose you want to hack this thing to accept any password, not print fail. We are not going to be able to modify it and save it inside Hopper just because they took that out to punish you for using the free version. We were able to do that in immunity and Ollie debug, although it was pretty painful but you can at least find it here. So if we go take a look at the code, we can find the code that's going to print fail. So if I go to strings, for example, here's fail. If I double click that, it will go to where fail is stored. Now I'm still here in hex view, which is not what I want right now. So I go back to the normal view here. And now here's the fail and here's where I can go. This is where the string is stored, but I want to go to the instructions that make decisions about whether to print it. So I double click the xref to see the code. And here's the code. And this is just the other view of it. So it's going to do some kind of comparison. It's going to call the test PW subroutine. And it, uh, subroutines always return their or return value in EAX. So then it does test EAX to EAX and jumps if it's equal. This test will be true if EAX equals zero. That's what it means. It may not be obvious, but that is what it is. So if it's zero, it will print you win. And if it's not zero, you fail which is the convention. Zero is usually success from a subroutine and one is failure. So I would like to go here and there are various ways to do this. Um, you just to knock out some instructions and the one I wanted to do here, um, we talked about this already there to modify the executable. Um, I just want to see which one I planned here or else I'll make one up. Um, We want to trick it. We'd like to see the code that uses fail. Yeah, and let me find out how I'm going to modify it. Um, there we are. So simple ways to just fill in these bytes. That's what I wanted to do. So here's, it's going to compare. And if something is zero, it's going to go down here. So I could just knock all of this out. And then whether it wants to print this message or that message, it will print this message. That's the way it will always print you win. 
That's one simple brute force solution. There are many other ways to do it. You could put some command here to change the assembly to zero. You could remove the call to the subroutine so it never checks. There are plenty of ways to do it. But the simplest thing is just knock out all those bytes. And so to do that, I need this series of bytes starting BF95. This is one, two, three, four, five bytes, 10 bytes, 12 bytes. If I put 90, which is hex for NOP, on those 12 bytes, that will do it. Now, I can't do it here because I'm not allowed to edit inside this program. So I'm going to do it in hex editor. Hex editor is just a Linux hex editor, easy enough to use. And in order to find the good stuff, I'm just going to remember BF95, 07. That's the stuff I want to modify. So let's get out of here and go here and make it big. Shift control plus, there we go. Okay, and ls. Okay, I've got password. I'm gonna copy pwd to pwd3, just so I'm not halting my original. I'm gonna use hex edit pwd3. And this is just like nano, except for hex, which is very handy. Almost the key presses are the same too. So the thing to look for here is bf95. So it's control W or control S, control S to search, BF95. And there it is, BF95. And I remember the third byte is seven. So I believe I have hit the right area. So I just need to remove 90, 12 bytes here. And I can just type right on top of this. One, two, three, four, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. That should be right, ending in BF. And so I save it like you would in Nano with control X and then Y. And so this one, if I run the original program, PWD, and I put in a password of A, I get fail. But if I run the modified one and put in a password of A, I win. So it's working. Not like it's a big deal, but <coughs> it's a way to see what you can do with this uh, disassembly. All right. And the last bit is debugging, which is a little screwy, but it does work. I find the text editor GDB to be just fine. I'm probably the best answer. This is one of many programs that attempt to put graphics on top of GDB. And the end result is pretty much like Windows 3.1. You know it's just DOS behind there. And it's really not helping that much to put pretty pictures on it. That's what I think. But anyway, you can see it. This is a 64-bit machine, so might be a little bit nice to have the graphics. I'm not sure. Anyway, let's put it back in Hopper. So I go to this launch pad thing, hit H, and I can run Hopper again. It was good to leave and come back anyway, so I don't um, use up my half hour. Then I read executable to disassemble and load PWD again. Now, since I can't modify it and save it, it's harmless to keep opening my original here. Otherwise, I might want to make a copy of it and work from a copy. So I get back in here. And now what I want to do is put a breakpoint in it. So let's go to um, main and put a breakpoint there, I think. I'm going to, yeah, put it right there at the start of main. So here I am in my program, and there's start. You may remember we've seen this before. There's a thing called start, which is different than the thing called main. The thing called start is what the operating system goes to to run a C program. The thing called main is where the C starts. So the start is not as interesting to me as the main, and you can get there here with the label main. That gets me to the actual beginning of the code that was created by compiling C code I wrote. Now you can actually click here to put a breakpoint there. You can also do modify toggle breakpoint, or maybe it's in one of the other menus. Um, it is navigate toggle breakpoint. Okay, navigate toggle breakpoint, and it will put that little red dot there to tell you there's a breakpoint. So now I can run the program. And to do that, I open the debugger, which is this window. And this is just a very simple graphical front end to GDB. That's all it is. And if I close this pane on the left, and uh-oh, uh I've somehow wandered to the wrong place. Let's see if I can get back to where I need to be. Main. Okay, there we are. Close this pane on the left. Now I can see the code and the debug code at the same time, which is kind of nice. So here are the buttons you should expect to see. This is run or continue that will run the code. This is pause, which is completely useless here, just like it's useless in GDB because code runs fast. You're not going to stop running code. As far as I can tell, it actually hit anything of interest. I've never used the pause button. I don't know why it's there. 
Then you got step into and step out, which are just what we talked about before. Step into executes the next instruction. And if you're at a call, it, actually, it goes into the call and it stops at the first instruction it finds there. So you end up going into subroutines deeper and deeper. Step out does the opposite. It zips ahead until it hits a return and goes to whatever. And if it finds a call down, it will execute everything down there. And it will wait until it goes up one level from where it is and then come back, which is what you typically want to do. The most common reason for this is because you are trying to debug C code that somebody wrote where they're making mistakes, and you're not trying to debug the operating system or the kernel, which probably doesn't have bugs. That's a whole different job. So I go through C code, then it calls something like print. I don't really want to step through all the Microsoft code that does print because I don't really expect to find problems there, and that's not my goal. So I step over all that. Let's stay up at the level that this developer wrote and not go into the operating system and the function calls. That's why you need this stuff. And here's step over. So you step in to move into subroutines, step out to move out of subroutines, and once you're at the level you're interested in, then you use step over to move forward at that level. So even if you call something, it'll automatically jump over it. And that's about it. So I can step in, since I'm no, I take the, if I step in, notice over here on the left, this tells me where I am. If I do a step in, it's gonna move one step forward. I said, oh, I gotta start it, pardon me. Okay, I start it. It hits the breakpoint and stops, and when it does, it marks it. This is the RIP. That's the instruction pointer. It also happens to be RAX because the way this code loads, it puts that value in RAX also. That's not what controls execution, but it does have a copy of the code. And here you see your registers. Here's RAX. Here's our RIP, the instruction pointer. Notice it's all full of zeros here. Uh, that has to do with however it's handling 32-bit code on a 64-bit system, which I'm kind of surprised you can do at all, but it is doing it. So... I step into it, it now goes to the next instruction. RAX is still sitting up there, but RIP is moving forward. So if I move forward a few steps, I'm gonna hit a call. So I step into and step into, now I'm at a call. It's gonna call test PW. Since I'm doing step into, it's gonna move into test PW and stop as soon as it gets inside there. So now I'm in the test PW function and here you see the call stack. I was in main, then I created a new stack frame on top of that for the test PW variables. And if test PW calls a subroutine, I'll have another one. That's the call stack, which we've used many times here. If there was an overflow here, you can overflow the return pointer and take over the machine, which we've done. So if I step into a bit more, I'm gonna hit a call inside here. It's about to print something, J print F. So if I step into here, I'm gonna end up in system code, which is not what I want. So I'm going to step over which will go through the print statement and come back and go to here. And now if I step over, I'm wandering at this level through the code. All right, now what I wanna do is proceed until we, um, we have data input, which is gonna be pretty soon. If I step over again and step over again, I'm about to do another system call for J gets. This is what's gonna get the password from the user. So if I step over at this point, it grays out and stops going and just shows me running because it's entered a subroutine and the subroutine is waiting for input from me. It cannot come back from that subroutine. So now if you wish to continue, you have to answer this question and there should be a button someplace to get me to the other window. Let me check my instructions. Now you go here and you go here. You step over a bunch more times. You get to this running, and now it is, you saw it, yeah, I'm looking for it. Where is it? Oh, there it is. Thank you. Good. That's what I couldn't find. Thank you very much. There. So this shows you the console. This is very much like that Windows debugger, WinDebug, where it's a command line, and for some reason they stick it in a GUI just to pretend it's not a command line. And we know it's a command line application. There's this. Now you put in your password, like a Z enter now it, it accepts it and goes back and now it breaks because i did a step over so that's how it runs and you can now step through the program and you could use this graphical environment to do all the projects we've done where you see it figure out inject the long thing look in the memory to see where it went if you find it handy i find gdb to be just as easy but this is one way to go um, the idea of course is to try to give you an experience like ali debug in linux and um, 
in my opinion, it's not any better than most GUIs on Linux, which is you really wouldn't want to live on it. Although the people I know that really love Hopper, they run it on the Mac. It's really designed for the Mac. The Linux version is sort of an afterthought, not so perfect, and it's very optimized for Mac. So you run it directly on the Mac. Um, and Thomas did this on my best Mac assembly language program. He used Hopper on the Mac to disassemble the Mac OS and find bugs in it. And it's really good for that. Although, before, after a year or two, he just paid the 5,000 bucks to get Ida Pro. All the professionals use Ida Pro and they get huge monitors and they spend all day long in that thing. And it's a steep learning curve like Photoshop. And once you really know that, it's a real specialty you can get a job. But anyway, Hopper's an alternative for cheap. Uh, there are plenty of others out there and you should know about them uh, and know what this task is. Most of the rest of us try and avoid assembler as much as possible, but you can get used to it. A little bit of assembly now and then is, is just a ticket. Anyway, that's all I wanted to show you, unless you folks have questions. I'm going to stop this and go to the lab and see if anybody needs help on homework. I chat message is coming in. What kind of countermeasures? Yeah, to make it hard to use the debugger. Yeah. Um, you, uh, the simplest, there are quite a few of them. If you look in the um, malware analysis book, there's a whole chapter in this, anti-disassembly. And they all involve making the code not sequential. You put in jumps that go somewhere. By the way, there's a really horrible one that came out about a year ago after that book was written. Somebody figured out that move is NP complete, which means the move assembly command is the only command you need. You can do everything with move. You can even do an if with move because you can move something which will cause an exception and then it goes to the exception handler and you could have moved data into the exception handler. So you can use move to perform an if or a jump or a call. And so somebody wrote an assembler that will assemble your code into nothing but move instructions. And good luck reading that. That's one way. That's a really brutal way, but that does work. The other way to do it is just make an assembly that will add junk in the middle, in between the instructions, and have a lot of, add a couple of codes, then jump comes to just a few step, few bytes ahead, put junk in the middle, and do that over, take the code and scramble it so it's not in order. This goes up here, goes up here. This is what I always used to do before the days of structured programming anyway. I wrote Fortran 4, and I would go to here, and go to there, and go to there, and the actual flow was like a bunch of flies landing on the page. Nobody could understand anything. That's a perfectly valid way. You could write compilers to do that. And then it's miserable for the poor malware analyst trying to put this all together. So those are basically what you do. And um, they refer to it specifically as anti disassembly if it breaks the common products like Ida Pro. So Ida Pro does not even create the correct assembly language instructions. And that's fairly easy to do. There are some examples in the practical malware analysis book samples of ones that have been compiled in this way. So Ida Pro cannot disassemble them. Uh, Ida Pro does have the ability to let you go manually do the disassembly, just like you can manually mark the code. You say, no, this instruction should start here. Ignore this byte. This instruction should start here. You can guide it through. And that's what you would have to do in such a case. Any others? All right. Well, that's it. I'm going to shut this down and go to the lab and see if anybody needs help. All right. <laughs>